Well, good morning, Calvary. It's uh, great to see you gathering uh, for worship this morning. And uh, we want to start our service today with a song that just invites us as people of God to come and rejoice together, to lift up our voices in song. So let's do that as we stand and sing this song together. our time together. Uh, hey, why don't you find somebody close to you this morning and just say hello. Uh, introduce yourselves before you're seated. Yes, good morning, everyone. So good to have you here this morning. Welcome to our service. Welcome to this beautiful, balmy spring day. Well, we're a couple of days away from spring, and uh, I just want to remind you that Easter is on its way. We have these lawn signs that we would love for you to pick up and get on your yard. And uh, let's get some Facebook pictures going as well again this year. So take some good pictures with yourself by your lawn sign, and let's go viral with this. I don't like that word viral anymore. We need some different word. <laughs> Some different word that uh, talks about that, but Easter is on its way. We also have little cards that you can give out uh, as well that, guess what, they look like little signs, and you can give these out to uh, your friends and family as well. So let's get some stir going here in the Durham region about Easter, 
and that it's on its way and no better than to get some signs on your yards. We have some left. Let's get them out of here today if you haven't yet done that. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Also, this coming Saturday is our marriage conference. And uh, if you haven't yet signed up for that, $35, do so online. You can sign up or at the office and let us know you're coming. It's for everybody, for all ages, for all marriages. We want marriage to last for a lifetime here. And uh, that's what this seminar is all about. And uh, you will receive this book when you, uh, when you uh, arrive and register. It's called I Still Do. And I've read a fair number of marriage books. This is the best book I have ever read. Every single chapter is really, really rich and filled with really important things for marriage. And uh, so I highly endorse this. We also have cards to hand out as well. You don't have many days to do this because it's this Saturday, 8 o'clock registration. We'll feed you something when you get here. We're working on child care for everybody, so don't, don't stay away. It's for every age uh, to be here. So that's coming up, uh, Pastor Steve. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Rick. I'm going to invite us to stand to our feet once again and raise our voices in worship, celebrating that the Lord Jesus Christ is our salvation. He's our
so great just to be together this morning and to remember who our Lord Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us. And he is our light eternal. He is our hope. We have so much to be thankful for. Let's continue to give thanks to God for the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ.
is my life and my salvation. Who shall I be afraid? It's so good as God's children to know who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are His children, and He is our salvation. Amen, church? What a great truth for us to celebrate this morning. For He is our hope. He is our light. He is our salvation.
Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for the redemption that is available to each and every one of us because of the cross this morning. Lord, we know that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And Lord, we are so thankful. In fact, we gather here this morning because of you, because of the cross, because of the work you've done for us. We gather to worship you, to praise you, to thank you, to acknowledge you for who you are. And we know that it began with the cross. So thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you love us so much and you care about each and every one of us. You know us as individuals. You know our needs, our desires, our wants, our challenges. And Lord, we want to bring before you today a few that are that are sick and in need of your healing touch lord we think of nina and michael and susanna and darlene pray for heather and muriel and harry and hugh and ray lift them up to you this morning and ask that you would provide them with all that they need to face today and the days to come lord please heal where healing is needed provide comfort where comfort is needed And Lord, most of all, keep their eyes fixed on Jesus because our help comes from the Lord and we want to rest in that today, Lord, especially for those that are facing challenges today. Lord, we think too of those that uh, have experienced loss in recent days, Lord. We, uh, We pray for May Meadows and her family on the passing of her brother down in the Philippines, Lord. Be her comfort today and and watch over this family. Lord, we also pray for Betty Newell. And uh, we're just so sorry to hear about the passing of her husband, Bill. And we thank you for him and, and the many, many years they have spent at this church serving here. Uh, Lord, we just lift Betty before you, ask that you would be her comfort. Comfort her with a comfort that can only come from God. And Lord, as... Others in our church are probably grieving. We pray for them as well. We know grief doesn't just go away immediately. Some are grieving after loss from a long time ago. And Lord, we just lift them before you and ask that you would care for them, provide for them, and again, keep their eyes on Jesus through every circumstance. Lord, we pray for those that are not able to get out like they used to. We we lift Ruth Desjardins before you. This morning, representing our shut-ins, we thank you for for her, and we pray you would remind her today that she is a part of this local body of Christ, that we love her and that you love her, and you are with her every single day. We thank you, Lord, of our global partners and the many ministries that we are able to be involved in in our community and around the world. Lord, we think of Tim Bahula with ABWA today. Lord, uh, give him all that he needs to face all that you put before him, Lord, as he supports that mission in so many practical ways. Lord, watch over him and care for him and strengthen him, Lord, and encourage him. And then, Lord, we pray for the Bible Club movement, that great uh, movement that's been going on for so many, many years, Lord. So thankful that they continue to get the word of God out before the people, Lord, for children and adults and everyone alike, Lord because we rest on your word. Lord, we bring these requests before you today because we know you want to hear from us. You tell us to bring our requests before you. So we do that, Lord, acknowledging that you are a good and loving and perfect God and you will take care of everything according to your sovereignty. So we commit these all to you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to continue to worship you now with our tithes and our offerings. Lord, thank you for the way you support this church and through this church, many ministries around the world. And Lord, uh, pray for Pastor Rick as he brings uh, the message to us this morning. Lord, give us ears to hear and hearts that are open and, and just that your Holy Spirit would be working in our hearts to hear what you have for us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stop. 
holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is forevermore. It's been just a great privilege for us to worship together, to worship the great I Am. Amen, church? We're going to continue to worship now. And this next song that we sing just affirms what we believe in, the truth of who the Lord Jesus is, that He is part of the Holy Trinity, that we believe the Scriptures. As we sing, we're going to have our children go to their time of children church right up to our junior highs. They can be discussing. Let's sing together. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one,
And together as God's church, we say, amen. We believe. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, we thank you for this glorious moment of praise where we could lift up our believing hearts to you and declare who we are, what we believe, because of who you are. Our Father, thank you that the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is Lord of glory, as Savior of the world, is the bread of life, is the one who gives us life, the one who died for us that our sins could be forgiven. We believe in Jesus. Jesus, the name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so, Father, as we turn our attention to the written declaration of the truth about Christ, that we might believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we might have life in his name, I pray, O Lord, that you will grant us eyes to see and ears to hear, hearts to respond to the truth today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What does being free mean to you? Free to do whatever you want? Free to believe whatever you want? Free to go wherever you want? Free from government restrictions? At least the ones you don't like? What do you think Jesus meant when he said, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed? Are you free today? Would you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 8 this morning, please? John chapter 8. We're still at the Feast of the Tabernacle. We are at the lamp lighting ceremony time. time where they looked back and remembered their wandering in the desert as they were liberated from Egypt. And if you remember, according to the account in Exodus, during the day there was a cloud that went before them to direct them. And during the night there was a pillar of fire that stayed over them symbolizing the presence of God among them. God's directing presence visible to them. And so they looked back and remembered what God had done and how God had delivered them and how God was their direction and was their light. But also the Feast of the Tabernacles, in particular the lighting ceremony, was a reminder to them of what was ahead of them. They were looking back to what God had done and how he had delivered them and protected them. And they were also to look forward, look ahead to what was promised to them uh, in such prophecies as Zechariah 14, 7 to 8. In that day, meaning the day of the Lord, in that day there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle for it will be a unique day which is known to the Lord. Neither day nor night, but it will come about that at evening time, there will be light. And in that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the Eastern Sea and the other half toward the Western Sea. It will be summer as well as in winter. They were meeting in the temple treasury by now, the Feast of the Tabernacles. It was called the Court of the Women because the treasury needed to have access to everyone so they could bring their offerings. And it's in the 
court of the women in the um, temple treasury area that at the end or near the end of the Feast of Tabernacles, they would put up four columns in the temple court area, four lamp columns. And on those columns would be four bowls, large bowls of oil on each of the columns. So there were 16 in total bowls of oil. And for wicks, they would use worn priest's undergarments. Not sure the significance of that. Other than it would light really well. And there was this amazing lighting ceremony of, of, of these lamps. Great finale of the Feast of Tabernacles. In fact, it was said in the Mishnah, which is the codification of the oral tradition, your law, as the Bible, as Jesus often called it. In the mission, it said, if you haven't seen the lighting ceremony at the Feast of Sukkoth or Tabernacles, you have never seen a wonder. Now, of course, in Jerusalem, it, they didn't in those days have street lights and all the lighting that we have and the amazing things that we presently have. They just had darkness at night and a few little tiny lamps. The lighting of this in the court of the, um, of the women, the temple treasury, and all the, the limestone walls of the, the temple would light up and illuminate. It literally, it seemed as if it would illuminate all of Jerusalem at night. It was a spectacular scene. It was at that point that Jesus stepped forward and said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John chapter 8, we have the account written for us. The account where Jesus is fighting for the light of life with the keepers of the light. And it starts this way. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, verse 12 of John 8, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And how did the Pharisees respond? The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I am going, but you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are right because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked him, where is your father? You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his time had not yet come. Once more, Jesus said to them, I am going away and you will look for me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. This made the Jews ask, will he kill himself? Is that why he says, where I go, you cannot come? But he continued, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. 
Now listen to this. I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am. You will indeed die in your sins. Who are you, they asked. Just what I have been claiming all along, Jesus replied. I have much to say in judgment of you, but he who sent me is reliable, and what I have heard from him I tell the world. They did not understand that he was telling them about his father. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am, and that I do nothing on my own, but speak just what the Father has taught me. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. And even as he spoke, many put their faith in him. Let's pause there for now. Out of this chapter today, I want to share with you a couple of things that we need to seriously consider that Jesus has taught here. Urgent life and death, life or death statements made by Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles. We need to remind ourselves, first of all, of, of the reality of saving faith, what saving faith believes. Now, it has been indicated to us in Hebrews eleven six 6 that he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Those two things make up saving faith. Believing that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I, I want to show you that uh, the writer of Hebrews got that fundamentally from John chapter 8. Because that's the presentation of the gospel that Jesus presents here. That you must believe that I am and that you must believe that I reward those who diligently seek me. That's what he teaches here. And so the first thing that we need to seriously consider is the statement he makes in, in verse 24, and it is this, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. That's an impactful statement. It's a clear statement, it's understandable, it's freighted with all kinds of theological uh, uh, information, but it is clear and to the point, unless you believe that Jesus is I am, you will die in your sins. And if you die in your sins, you cannot enter the kingdom of God in eternity. That's a summary statement that Jesus makes. He states this, the I am statement to the people, the ego and me, I am. It's the second time Jesus has used and dropped the I am truth bomb. I am the bread of life. Now I am the light of the world. But we know that he is referring to the I am statements of the Old Testament. And there are many. In Isaiah 9:2, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in the land of the shadow of death, the light will shine on them. He speaks of the light. The, he, when, when John speaks of Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 5, says there he is the light that shines in the darkness. In Genesis 1, 3, it is the light that God first creates. Jesus' self-disclosure here of I am the light of the world was a clear statement, the clearest statement of, of uh, divinity that has, has, has been made to this point. And it's a direct reference to Christ as the new pillar of light and the source of salvation. The Lord is the light, the psalmist writes in Psalm, Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is the light of my, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom, in whom shall I fear? In, in Proverbs 8, 22, God's wisdom is the light that illumines the world. In Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus alone leads people from the darkness of sin's deadening effects on them. The journey 
to the, into the light of God's rescue from the journey to, into sin. Literally from death to life. Walking in the light is discipleship. 1 John 1, 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him and with one another. It's the way mankind walks away from death. God describes his own presence as light. Jesus is the incarnation of God. Sixteen times in the Gospel of John, Jesus is referred to as light. One for every bowl on the lampstand, maybe. From the one not of this world to those worldlings, Jesus makes it very clear to them. Verse 24, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am. You will die in your sins. How many times have we encountered I am in the scriptures? In Exodus 3, 13 to 14, then Moses said to God, Behold, I am about to come to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they will say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Isaiah 41.4, who has worked and done it, calling forth the generations from the beginning. I, Yahweh, am the first and with the last. I am he. Isaiah 43.10.25, you are my witnesses, declares Yahweh, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Isaiah 48, 12, hear me, O Jacob, even Israel, whom I called. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. Isaiah 52, 6, therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore in that day I am the one who is speaking. Here I am. How could that have escaped their notice as Jesus stood in that Feast of Tabernacles lamp lighting ceremony and called out to him, to them, and to all who will listen, I am the light of the world. I am saving God. I am very Yahweh God. Jesus came to rescue humans from their determination to abuse and oppress one another in the darkness of sin. And the response of the Pharisees is to call him out on a testimony technicality. Sorry, Jesus, you're not allowed to witness to yourself. Jesus says back to them, I surely am and have the authority to witness to myself. But just to satisfy you, I stand beside the Father. The Father and I witness to this being true. So there's your two witnesses. And so they ask him, well, where is your Father? And Jesus responds to them, you do not know me or my father. If you knew me, you would know my father. That you don't know me, in other words, makes it impossible for you to know the father. Listen, listen carefully to all the religious people of this world. If you don't know Jesus, it is impossible 
to know the God of the universe. It's impossible. That's our message. That's the message of Christ. That's the gospel message. That's the mes message we take to the world. That's why we have missionary hearts. People need to hear this message. They need to know that the God they want to know cannot be known unless they know Jesus. They um, got very nasty to Jesus a little bit later on in verse 41. They said to him, you, um, you are doing the, the things your own father does. And they said, we are not, Jesus said that. And then they said, we are not illegitimate children. We are not illegitimate children. Do you know why they said that to Jesus? You know why. Because the rumors abounded that Jesus was the product of an illegitimate relationship that Mary had with someone. Jesus could not have a human father or he could not have been our savior. And this is what he's explaining to them. They said, we were not born, literally they said, we were not born of pornea. like you were. So then they ask him, who are you? He answers them in verse 28. So Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am and that I do nothing on my own but speak just what the Father has taught me. As far as Jesus is concerned, his defense of himself, his apologetic to the world will be the cross of Calvary. His death, his resurrection, his ascension into the presence of the Father. And there will be no other. Jesus will offer no other apologetic to the world. He will offer no other proof to the world than the cross of Calvary. His death and his resurrection. Those who will not believe in the witness of Christ being lifted up. And by the way, lifted up to the cross lifted up from the grave, lifted up from this world into the presence of the Father. That's what he meant by lifted up. All of those liftings. If the world will not believe that, it is the only witness I will give. If you will not believe that, you will die in your sins. Why? Because that's how sins are forgiven. Genuine faith in Jesus is the only hope of escape from the death, of death in our sins. And the response, the result, many, it says, put their faith in him, verse 30. But we're left to ask the follow-up question, or did they? Or did they? So let's read on. To the Jews who had believed him, who are they? the ones we just encountered in verse 30. To the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, now verse 31, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. <laughs> this is kind of a, a moment where it's just, Jesus should have just signed it, kind of broken up into hysterical laughter. You have never been slaves of anyone. Oh, let me think. How about everyone? Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, 
presently roam, need I say any more? I mean, what are you even talking about? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the father's presence and you do what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do the things Abraham did. As it is, you are determined to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the things your own father does. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and now I'm here. I have not come on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet, because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why don't you believe me? He who belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus, but I honor my Father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. I tell you the truth, if anyone keeps my word... He will never see death. At this, the Jews exclaimed, Now we know that you are demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that if anyone keeps your word, he will never taste death? Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, If I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you. But I do not know him and and I but I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. You are not yet fifty years old, the Jews said to him, and you have seen Abraham? I tell you the truth, Jesus answered Before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. This also is the word of God. So here we are. The first key truth, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. It says there, many believed him. Many believed him, note. See what it says there? to the Jews who had believed him. Jesus is now going to teach them what believing in him really means. Okay? That's why he says this. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. It is important for us to know and note that this is an important word for the cultural moment we all live in. The cultural moment in Christianity. The cultural moment in, in this vast uh, number of people in our world who claim to be Christians. And there are many, millions and millions and millions of people who claim to be Christians, who claim to believe Jesus, Jesus is now clarifying what that really looks like, believing Jesus. 
And so to those who in verse 30, many put their faith in him, he's now talking to the same audience. And now we don't know specific person by person, okay? Can't parse that from here. But we do know that there's a group of people there listening to his teaching that is going to continue who are Jews, who have put their faith in him, and now he is going to talk to them about what that really means. It's not about your ethnicity. It's not about your heritage. It's not about your culture. It's not about your family. It's not about your church. And it's not about your interest in the things of Jesus. It's whether or not you hold fast to the teachings of Jesus Christ. That's who disciples are. Those who abide, those who continue. It's the same word we're going to see in John 15 uh, on the vine. Those who cling to the vine, those who hold to the vine, those who hold fast to my teaching, Jesus said are really my disciples. Not just those who express some interest in me or say they even believe me, not, not those, but those who hold fast to my word. Truly, you are my disciples. The scandal of religion is always who you believe Jesus is. And you can only discover who Jesus is through his word. There's no superficial belief or false sense of spiritual security that is ever allowed by Jesus. God is not desperate for a crowd. No easy believism or Christianity light with Jesus. I, you, you never encounter anything like that in Jesus' teachings. You must deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. What Jesus says, he's not looking for fans as, one, as, the, as the book uh, points out. He's looking for followers of his word, his teachings, authentically believe. I was listening to a debate with Jordan Peterson and um, Prager, what's the guy's name? What's his first name, Don Prager? That guy, I forget. Huh, what's his name? Dennis, that's it. Dennis Prager and, and uh, um, Jordan Peterson. You all know who I'm talking about? Sort of. Anyway, Prager asked Peterson, by the way, this is not in my notes, and I timed my notes out, so I'm in trouble already. Uh, but it's, it's Jermaine. So Prager asks Peterson, do you believe in God? Because he says, all kinds of people are asking that question because you give the impression that maybe you do. And he says, Peterson answers him this way. He says, I live as if God exists. He says, oh, um, what, what's, what do you mean by that? What, what's the difference between that believe in God and you live as if God exists? He says, because, he says, I look around this world, if anybody actually really believed in God, it would be impossible for them to live out that belief. So awesome is the God who must exist that I can't allow myself to say I believe in him because there's nothing about my life that actually lives out what believing in a sovereign, ultimate, incredible, amazing God would be like. I'm thinking to myself, finally, someone who understands what believe is, but he doesn't understand that God will help you believe, that God will help you to live out your belief. Believe in him and trust him to allow you to live out your belief. This is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, do you really believe in me? Not, not do you just believe me, but do you believe in me? 
Not that you believe I'm standing here teaching, teaching you interesting scriptural truths, but do you actually believe in me? Because if you believe in me, you will actually follow me. You will actually live for me. I will empower you by the Holy Spirit to live for me. That's what he's calling them to do. And if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples. Obedience, not generational lineage or tradition is what counts. A real believer, a real believer, Jesus says, holds firmly to the scriptures and seeks to understand them better, as Carson states. And in so doing, you prove that you are real. You believe that I'm real by proving that you are real. That's what Jesus is saying here. And in so doing, you will be set free. Not from bondage to Rome, the, the, the bondage you allegedly claim you, you don't have, you don't know anything about enslavement to all the countries you've been under bondage because of your sin. It's your sin, that's the issue. You need to be freed from your sin the greater danger for you is to die in your sins. Your soul needs to be free. You need to be free to, to, to serve me. Uh, a friend of mine was once candidating for a pastoral position and he delivered his vision statement for what he was gonna do if he were called by the church to be the senior pastor. And he, he told me that there was this little old lady who, uh, who said, uh, stood up in the, in the, the uh, process of uh, calling the pastor or a vote to call the pastor and she said she said um, I really like pastor I'm going to call him Barney I really like pastor Barney can we just vote for him and not his vision <laughs> see see this is this is what a lot of people want in Jesus they want Jesus they don't want his vision they want Jesus they don't want the requirement of how to live for Jesus. That's what was the issue here. And Jesus was having none of it. You're not going to follow me around in a big crowd and think that, that you've got it taken care of because you don't. And it's then that they started to turn on him. When, when Jesus started to talk about it, what it really means to be a follower of Christ, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, they start calling him a Samaritan. A racial slur in the, that day. They, they call him demon-possessed, which is, by the way, the unpardonable sin. When you call the work of God the work of the devil, when you walk away from the scriptures, you walk away from being a disciple of Jesus. And that's what's happening today all over the place. You've walked away from the truth. Jesus is the truth. And when sins overwhelm you, and they will, you don't know the truth. And if you don't know the truth, you won't be set free from your sin. Who's your father? They call, they ask him. God, Abraham. Jesus strips them of a, their moral claim to their heritage in verse 37 to 41. I know you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are ready to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, and you do not, and you do what you have heard from your father. And they were like, well, Abraham's our father, and Jesus says, no, Abraham's not your father. If Abraham was your father, you wouldn't want to kill me because that, Abraham wouldn't want to do that. And by the way, beloved, there's only two possible fathers that we can have. And if it isn't God, it's always the same other one. You are either, God is either your father or the devil is your father. That goes for every single human being in this world. Either God is your father or the devil is your father. That's how Jesus, Jesus simplifies things. He brings it down to, to core reality. If you stray and unhitch from the scriptures and are indifferent about the scriptures and you have no room for the scriptures, you can't be my disciple, Jesus says. If you explain away or argue away the, the scriptures rather than obey the scriptures, you can't be my disciple, Jesus says. 
If you remain enslaved to sin and guilty and secure and insecure, it's because you don't want me and you don't want to follow the scriptures. Our world today is drowning in mental health, mental unhealth. Literally drowning in mental unhealth. The only freedom from that is Jesus Christ and what he brings. People are enslaved to sin and guilt and are insecure and it's driving them into mental unhealth. And people are liars. The Bible's under siege. If Abraham isn't our father, then God certainly is. And Jesus says this to them, if God were your father, you would love Jesus. And you would remain in his word. And he would break the power of sin in your life and rescue you from the debilitating effects of sin's guilt. He who is of God hears the words of God, verse 47. For this reason you do not hear them, because you are not of God. You can recite the Lord's Prayer until you're blue in the face. But if you don't know Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior, those are just words that disappear into the vacuum. Because he who is or she who is of God hears the words of God. And for this reason, you do not hear them because you are not of God. The reason people don't listen to Jesus is because they don't know God. It's not an intellectual issue, it's a spiritual one. And so one last question they throw out to him, who do you think you are? (laughs) Who do you think you are? I was watching an onslaught last night online because a hockey player decided that he would not join in on the events of glorifying the LGBTQ community. I was watching him get slaughtered, but more grievously, I was watching God get slaughtered. You can't slaughter God, but they tried. People calling him a sky ghost, desperately outdated ideas, literally saying to God, who do you think you are? That was it. Just, just like this, nothing's changed. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? So Jesus said, well, before Abraham was, I am. Mic drop, everything that you can, anything you can possibly do. So, um, Jesus offers the promise here as very God that he alone brokers all personal access to God. And any hope that anyone has of escaping the consequences of sin are wrapped up in Jesus. And he alone. And he says this to them as I close this morning. If you walk in the light of Christ, holding fast to my word, you will truly be my disciple. You will know the truth. You will be made free from the enslavement to sin. You will not die in your sins you will neither see death nor taste it. How's that sound for a promise worthy of receiving and welcoming? Not freed from pain, not freed from suffering, not freed from poverty necessarily, not freed from abuse. Freed from sin. Freed from death. 
So many put their faith in him. How about you? You know, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. But are you free? Has your belief moved to saving faith, holding fast to the word of God as Christ has called us to? It's been said before that some people are going to miss eternal life by 12 inches. They have it here, but they've never welcomed Jesus here in their hearts. Our Father, I pray this morning that as we once again have encountered an answer to the question, who is Jesus? He is the Christ, the Son of God. He is very God. He is the light of the world. He is Savior. He is the only one who can rescue us from our sins. If we don't believe in Him, we will die in our sins. Unless we hold fast to His word, we are not His disciples, and we are not free. So our Father, we know what we have encountered in Your word today. It is up to us to believe, truly believe by the the work of the Holy Spirit to enable us, whether we're here in this room or listening online today, O Lord, Jesus asks the question, why, I've spoken to you clearly, why do you not understand? This, this is clear. We can only belong to God through Jesus Christ. And if we don't belong to God, our Father is the devil. And we will die in our sins. Father, would that message both bring joy and gladness to the hearts of those who belong to you and a serious and sober decision to those who don't. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to invite us to stand together as we sing in response to the challenge of God's word this morning.
of the book of Romans explained why so many religious people miss out in the salvation of God through Christ. His insight was this, that far too many people stop at the direction place that points to Christ instead of going all the way to Him. That's precisely what Christ encountered at the Passover feast, at the feast of the tabernacles and the water, at the feast of the tabernacles and the light. These were signs that pointed to the real thing in Jesus Christ who was standing right there in their presence. It, it, it would be the same as if you were deciding to go to Miami Beach and as you drove over the border of Florida state line you saw a sign that pointed in the direction of Miami Beach and you parked your camper there and stayed there and never went on to Miami Beach so many people even in today's church have stopped at the direction to Christ and have never found their way to him I've questioned lots of people about their faith. Say, do you believe? Are you a believer? Time and time again, people will say, I, I go to church. I read my Bible. I, I pray to God. No, that's not, that's not, that's the direction. You're camping at the directions to Jesus. You haven't gone to Him. And maybe you're relying on your service to the Lord or the fact that you read your Bible or you pray or you come to church or you're part of a Christian family, a heritage, whatever. These are things that point us to Christ. But you must come to Him for salvation. Don't delay. For in Him alone, is salvation. Our Father and our God, today, if people have heard your voice, I pray that they will not harden their hearts, but that they will respond to the invitation to know you, the great I am, the bread of life, living water, the light of life, Salvation itself is found in no other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we might be saved. The name is Jesus Christ and Him alone. We thank you for Christ. We love you. We praise you. We adore you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.